For at TV, the world is thinking. Where is Ken? I'm hoping he's... Come on up and tell us what you're going to tell us. Ken Cameron. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> okay, this morning, <clears throat> I thought I would uh, take you on a climb up Mount Everest and uh, show you what it was like to be there when Everest had the worst disaster in its human history. There was a two-day storm that raged on and on, and during that time, I was the only doctor on the mountain. It was, uh, it was awesome to see the power of the mountain, but it was even more awesome to see one human being and his ability to withstand that, that storm. This is Mount Everest. It's 29,035 feet high. If you think about it, that's uh, the height at which some transatlantic jets fly, cruising altitude. It's an extreme environment. At, at the summit, there's only one-third as much oxygen as there is at sea level. The temperatures can be 40 degrees below zero with winds 20 miles an hour or more. Uh, it's the kind of condition that you'd find on a summer day on Mars. And yet, uh, the climbers are exposed out there for 16 to 20 hours. And uh, the conditions are so severe, I remember on one of my own summit attempts, I reached inside my down jacket for a drink from my water bottle, only to find that the water bottle, which was against my chest, had frozen solid. This is the route up Everest. It's the South Coal route. It uh, starts at base camp, mounts through four camps. It takes th three months to build our camps and then get ready for the summit attempt. So uh, this is a view of base camp. This is where we start with our supplies and run them up the mountain, uh, trip after trip, kind of leapfrogging up the mountain. Here I am setting up my medical tent at base camp. Four yak loads of supplies were dumped in the tent, and it was my job to organize them into a medical unit. And this was our expedition. There were three main expeditions on the mountain. There was one from Scott Fisher's American team, one with Rob Hall's New Zealand team, and our team, which was uh, run by National Geographic, but uh, organized by the Explorers Club. This is a view from base camp starting up the climb. It's the uh, first 2,000 feet are through what's called the ice fall. And this is a picture taken in the icefall. It's literally a frozen waterfall, which actually moves very slowly. When you're in this, it's like being a rat in a maze. You can't even see over the top. And you climb 2,000 feet through the icefall. This is a picture taken near the top of the icefall. We always climb through at night because uh, there's always a risk of these blocks of ice falling on you uh, as it melts. So during the night, it's the coldest time. It's least likely to, to have any uh, tumbling of ice blocks. This picture of me crossing a crevasse on the way up uh, through the ice fall. We cross on aluminum ladders, which are bolted together, and I have a harness on with uh, safety ropes, which are tied independently on either side of the crevasse. This is one of the crevasses we crossed. A lot of them are 10 stories deep or even more. Uh, one of my climbing friends says that the real reason we climb through at night is because we don't want to look down and see what we're <laughs> climbing over. <laughs> Okay, this is camp one, the first flat spot where you can uh, set up your tents after the first day of climbing. And then we move on up the mountain. This is a view taken looking back down the mountain. We're climbing on fixed ropes here. These are 250-foot uh, pitches, which we anchor into the ice so that if you fall, you don't fall 5,000 feet, you fall 250 feet. That's quite enough. Okay, this is a view looking up toward the summit of Everest. You can see uh, over here, you really get an idea of the slope that you're climbing. This is a relentless slope that we climb up. Uh, and notice here that this, up toward the summit of Everest, there's no snow. Everest is in blackface. And that's because it's so high, it's in the jet stream. And the winds are constantly scouring the face of Everest. So uh, the snow doesn't get a chance to accumulate. What looks like a cloud behind the summit ridge is, in fact, just snow being blown off the top. So we climb on up toward the summit, up into the clouds and into the thin air, and stop at Camp 4, the highest camp. Uh, everyone's on oxygen at Camp 4, and oxygen supplies are limited, so you only have a few hours, really, to decide if the weather is good enough to go for the summit or not. So here's a couple of climbers resting on oxygen. Here's a picture of Rob Hall. He was the leader of the New Zealand team. 
Uh, here he is on, using his radio. Uh, this actually was a radio that uh, he used to call his wife later on in the story. And these are some climbers up at Camp 4 waiting to see if they can make an attempt for the summit. And the summit's up here. This is actually uh, too much of a snow plume. This means too much wind, and that would not be a condition where you'd be able to go for the summit. You'd have to back down if that stayed that way. But uh, for us up near the summit, we waited a while, and uh, actually the weather cleared. And you see the snow plume disappeared. It looked quiet and calm. It looked like a good chance to go for the summit. So team started out at midnight. We always start at midnight on summit day to give us as much time as possible to make it up and back. Here are some climbers just starting up toward the summit, uh, summit ridge. And here's a climber on the summit ridge. This is the last 1,500 feet of Everest. Uh, is along a sheer ridge that you see here. Um, this climber's moving up toward the summit. But what happened that fateful season was that uh, the storm unexpectedly picked up. And here you see some really ferocious wind blowing up off the top of the summit. Climbers were already up on the southeast ridge when this storm hit. This is a picture uh, taken up near the, on the southeast ridge, up near the summit. This is me. I've got uh, completely covered over with, uh, with gear. I've got a face mask on with a rebreather. You can see in this climber, he's got two oxygen tanks in his backpack with a hose leading up to his oxygen. Uh, we carried two, two titanium oxygen tanks and uh, not much else, maybe a chocolate bar and a pair of gloves and a water bottle. This is a picture taken along the southeast ridge. Uh, this is the final approach toward the summit of Everest. This is where these climbers were caught in the storm. And if you notice, the climbers are all unroped. That's because this area is such a sheer drop-off that if you were roped to another climber, you would likely just pull that climber off the mountain with you. So you're sort of on your own. If you're going to fall, there's no need to take somebody else with you. If you fall to your left, you fall 8,000 feet into Nepal. If you fall to your right, you fall 12,000 feet into Tibet. So uh, it's probably better to fall into Tibet because you'll live a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, you fall for the rest of your life, so don't, <laughs> don't know that it really matters. <laughs> okay, as those climbers were up there in that, in that storm, up here near the ridge, I was down here in Camp 3. This is 2,000 2, feet below them. We were uh, getting some radio information, but uh, the storm was bad enough that we were having a tough time just staying in our tents down 2,000 feet below where these guys were in, in a lot of trouble because of the exposure and the, the uh, high winds and the cold. The situation was really grave. Uh, with radio contact, we learned that Rob Hall was stuck up here right below the summit with another climber, Doug Hansen. Rob was a super climber, but Doug was a weak climber. And Rob was staying with Doug. And uh, Doug was unable to descend this part here, which is called the Hillary Step. So they were stuck up in here. Another climb we heard about was Beck Weathers. Beck was uh, unable to summit and had co apparently collapsed in the snow. Some climbers had passed him and left him for dead and kept on descending. Besides those uh, two climbers, there, was eight, there were 18 other climbers whose whereabouts were unknown. We had no idea what was going on with them. We were getting all these conflicting, confusing reports and uh, a lot of chaos. Our two, strongest, our two strongest climbers, Todd Burleson and Pete Athens, uh, determined to go up and try to effect a rescue. I was struck by the fact that they started their conversation not with whether they should go, but the first words were, how quick can we get ready? And the, the two of them uh, got ready to go, and just before they left, they gave a radio message out to Rob Hall, who was stuck high up on the mountain with the other climber. I expected the message to be something like, uh, hold on, Rob, we're coming. But in fact, what they told Rob was that he should abandon Doug and save himself. He said the situation was hopeless, and there would be no point in two people dying. He should just leave Doug and come on down himself. And Rob got that message, and his response was, we're both listening. Okay, uh, Todd and Pete did make it up. 
they, they went up the slope here, up onto the ridge, and did what they could to save anybody they could find. It was a scene of total chaos. There were ripped tents. People didn't know who was in the tent and who was not. People were missing. But uh, with radio advice from me, and just knowing a lot on their own, they were able to, to stabilize the situation, get a lot of climbers back in shape, and lead them, or sort of send them back down the mountain toward me, down here at Camp 3. But Camp 3 is not a place where you can treat anybody. It's a little notch cut into the ice slope on a 45 degree angle. You can't even stand up straight in there. The only medicines I had at that height was a plastic bag filled with some frozen syringes, which I had to warm up under my arm and uh, use as best I could. The climbers came by me. The ones who I thought needed medication, I would give injections to, sometimes even just putting the needle right through their clothes, because it was just too difficult to, to, to take any clothes off anybody. Give them some injections and send them back down the mountain. As we were doing that, Robin, uh, Rob Hall's condition just deteriorated more and more. Uh, Pete and, uh, and Todd were unable to get anywhere near Rob. He was way too high up on the mountain. And uh, he was still in radio contact, and he was told that no rescue was going to happen. He was just too high up and too exposed. Uh, at that point, Rob said that he'd like to speak to his wife. And he had a radio with him. He was patched into his wife, who was home in New Zealand, seven months pregnant with their first child. And he and his wife had a conversation as Rob lay in the snow there. And they named their baby. And then Rob signed off. And that was the last he was ever heard from. I was faced with treating a bunch of critically ill patients. Uh, and these were my medical supplies. This is a fishing tackle box that I filled with my supplies. And uh, this was waiting. This I had at a lower camp. There was no way I could treat people at Camp 3, so I descended to Camp 2. And the survivors were brought down to me at that camp where I could stage some kind of medical treatment. This was one of the climbers who arrived at, uh, at Camp 2 into my medical tent. It's very difficult treating people in this kind of condition. The temperatures are below zero. The altitude is 21,000 feet. That's a height at which, at which wounds won't heal, and a height at which you even sometimes get confused trying to tie your shoes. But nevertheless, I did what I could. I had some help. We tried to stabilize each of the climbers. Here you can see some really horrendous frostbite that I was taking care of. More, more frostbite. Patients were hypothermic, meaning low, had low body temperature and, and frostbitten parts everywhere. This climber had snow blindness. And as I was stabilizing all these, trying to stabilize all these climbers, we had had a previous report about Beck Weathers. He was left for dead up in the snow. And we just uh, assumed he was one of the unfortunate casualties. But then, lo and behold, Beck stumbled into camp. He just came in through the tent with, with some help. And uh, we laid him down on some sleeping bags. And I prepared to thaw him out. He was hypothermic and frostbitten. You can see this incredibly frostbitten hand he had here in his face. And uh, as I thawed Beck out and as he warmed up, he started telling me what had happened up there. He said he had gotten lost up on the mountain in the whiteout, lost all his energy collapsed in the snow, and laid there. He was aware the climbers were coming by him, but he was totally powerless to even make a move. He couldn't even signal that he was still alive. So he laid in the snow a day, a night, and another day. And at the end of that time, he said he didn't want to die. And he started thinking about his family and how much he had to live for. And that, those thoughts propelled him. And Beck told me that made him get up and actually stumble his way back into the camp. When I heard that story, it was, uh, I, I was absolutely stunned. I, I couldn't imagine that any human being could withstand what he withstood and do that. And if you think about it, how does that really happen? How does a, a thought, an idea that you want to survive, how does that get translated into actual physical motion? How do you get up based on the idea that you had a thought that you wanted to survive? So to think about that, you have to really think about what's going on inside the human brain. It's a two and a half pound blob that generates a mere 25 watts of electricity. That's hardly enough to even power a dim light bulb. Yet 
there's more, that's, the human brain is, is, is the most complex machine in the universe. And we really don't understand much about what's going on. But to try to examine that mystery, you have to take a look at the human brain. It's roughly in three parts. The front part is where we think and uh, have, have uh, logical, logical uh, arguments, conditions. Uh, the middle part of the brain is, is where we form images, visual and, and uh, auditory images. It's, it's where we have our emotions and our memory stored. And the back part of the brain is like the maintenance center. This is where we pace our heart and our lungs and uh, control, control motion. So let's, let's take a cut through the brain about like that. And let's imagine that Beck, battling his, for his life in the snow, was hooked up to a SPECT scan. This is a, a machine which gives you dynamic blood flow. And therefore, the flow of energy within the brain can be very well traced. This is a kind of a normal shot. You can see there's blood and energy in the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part, the middle part where the emotions are and the images are is, is also lit up, and the back part where, his, where people uh, get their, uh, where the maintenance function is, where they are able to uh, pace heart and lungs and muscles. That's in the back. Okay, so now this is a normal shot. This might be what we would have seen when Beck realized he was in danger. All right, the prefrontal cortex is lighting up much more vividly than you see. You see the difference. And the other parts here are quiet. He's no longer thinking about these kind of images. He's concentrating fully on staying alive. But he's running out of energy. It's too cold. He's not really uh, got enough to keep him going. So this is what you see. The brain is quieting down. You see very little red where there's not much energy. You see a lot of green and yellow. Uh, Beck's brain is powering down. He's dying. But then, as Beck related it, he started thinking about his family. And you see the mid portion of his brain here is lighting up again. So he's going from that to that. He's starting to get energy in the mid portion of his brain generated by emotion and by memory of his family. And the energy is starting to move forward into this part of the cortex. This is called the anterior cingulate. It's a part of the cortex that a lot of neuroscientists believe is the seat of will. They believe this is where willpower comes from. So Beck is, is charging up that part of his brain by using emotional energy. And you can see it's getting more intense. The more he thinks about his family, the more he thinks about what he has to go back to, the more intense that area gets. Until finally, it generates enough energy to power his cortex, his thinking part of his brain up in here. So he's going from that to that. And then that energy sparks his, the rest of his cortex. And what little energy he has is, becomes distributed through his, uh, through his cortex. He's able to think again. And if you look back down here, you see he's also charged up this posterior part of the back part of his brain, where he's got, uh, where he's got his maintenance center. He's able to pace his heart and lungs now. This is what it was before. And this is what it is now. It's, it's brighter. He's got better control over his heart and lungs, better control of his muscle function. Beck was able to get up, turn around, and stagger his way back into the tent where we found him. After hearing that story uh, about how Beck could bring about his own salvation, I felt like what I was doing for him was pretty trivial, actually. But uh, I took care of him that night as best I could with the medications I had in this freezing tent. And uh, in the morning, we were able to get a helicopter rescue. We never thought we'd be able to do that because the helicopter ceiling was 17,000 feet. And we were at 21,000 feet. But this pilot risked his life to come in higher than the helicopter ceiling to try to effect a rescue. As he came in, he skidded up and down over the over the ice because he was depending on, on ground wash. He was depending on the rotors pushing down air and then have the air bouncing back up, so have a double effect. But each time he came over a crevasse, he lost that effect because the air would just go right down. So he was bumping up and down, skidding across the ice. And then one of the climbers got the literally brilliant idea to open a bottle of Kool-Aid and mark a big X on the ice so that the pilot would know where to land. And in fact, he did come in, landed safely, and we loaded Beck into the helicopter. And he took off with the pilot 
and what was the highest helicopter rescue in history. Well, they were back, was back in Kathmandu, in the capital, before we even got back to base camp. And at, at base camp, we were all stunned by what had happened, and we, were, uh, we gathered together for a, a memorial service at one of the, uh, at one of the camps in, at base camp. The Sherpas lit uh, a fire of juniper, because they believed the juniper smoke was holy. And the climbers, one by one, stood up on the higher rocks and said what they had to say uh, about the climbers that they had lost. A lot of them turned toward the mountain, spoke directly to some of the climbers who had died there. There was Scott Fisher. He, he, uh, he was leading the American expedition. We always thought Scott was Scott and he'd be OK, but he mysteriously died up there. Rob Hall, most experienced mountaineer in the world, to, to my mind, my friend for 10 years. And he died because he refused to abandon a climber much weaker than him. And I would have expected no less from Rob. And, and this was Doug Hansen, the climber who died with Rob. Andy Harris got lost in the storm and stepped off a cliff. And Yasuko Namba, she, was, she had summited, was on her way down and collapsed in the snow. Another climber found her. And she grabbed onto his back, and he started to drag her to safety. But then she fell off. And the climber said he didn't have the strength to hold her anymore. Twelve climbers died on Everest that year. Uh, the Sherpas believed that these Tibetan prayer flags, if you string them up at base camp and then write prayers on them, the wind will carry it up to the gods. But that year, at least for those 12 climbers, Everest wasn't listening. Thank you.